Welcome to Stuff You Should Know from HowStuffWorks.com. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark. There's Charles W. Chuck Bryan over there, and there's Jerry. So this is Stuff You Should Know. This is going to be a good one. This Agreed. Is a, this is a grabster joint. Did you want to talk about soup first? <laughs> were you kidding? Yeah, I was kidding. Oh, I thought you were serious. Yeah, no. It, oh, okay. was, it was bad soup, but I mean, it wasn't that bad. Well, yeah, I mean, right before we started recording, like, this is how how awesome things are around here. We were talking about how bad your French onion soup was. How do you mess up French onion soup? Yeah, that's what I was wondering. And then you said, save it, I want to talk about this, and I thought you were serious. Yeah, I was kidding. Oh, well, and here we are. I was kidding. <laughs> yeah, and then we were talking about the soup anyway. How do you mess up French onion soup? It's like beef broth, salt, onions, uh-huh. cheese, bread. Yeah, they put too much in it. Melt the, it in a crock pot. The, uh, yes, this, the onions they used were way too sweet. I think they used like Vidalia, Vidalia. onions dipped in sugar. Mm-hmm. It was just not good. Yeah. Not good. You can tell we shouldn't call them out no, publicly. No. That'd be pretty mean. Sure. I mean, they just don't know what they're doing with soup. It's fine. But they're a soup restaurant. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of soup restaurants. Yeah, I guess there are. Do you remember that <laughs> dumb one? I think they're out of business now. Let us surprise you. Remember there was that? nothing dumb about let us surprise you, buddy. <laughs> soup and salad place. I love that thing. That's out of business, right? Yeah, there's something called sweet tomatoes that's basically the same Oh, thing. I think I've heard of that. Yep. Hey, I like a good soup and salad joint. Yeah, so what was wrong with let us surprise you? I, I don't know. I, just, it, I don't like cutesy names Well, then, yeah. unless it's on The Simpsons. <laughs> and I think the teas were made of carrots. Yeah. Yeah? For sure. Yeah. Well, that leads us right into Navajo Code Talkers. Exactly. <laughs> Quite well. We should say right out of the gate that, um, we're, well, like you just said, we're talking about Navajo co- Code Talkers. There were plenty of other Code Talkers from yes. other Native American tribes. Yes. This episode is mostly about the Navajo Code Talkers because there were so many of them. Yes. And so much is known about the codes that they made. But We'll also mention other tribes as well. Yes, and straight up respect to all of them. For sure. It always kind of stinks when one thing gets all the glory, when there were many Mm -hmm. factions of that thing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. Right. But I think that's better than just naming this episode, like, how code talkers work, but only talking about the Navajo code talkers. Agreed. I think we covered everything, right? Agreed. So, um If you have ever seen or are familiar with a movie called Wind Talkers, (laughs) have you seen it? I I didn't see it, but I did look it up today. And it is widely regarded as not only garbage, a garbage movie, (laughs) but a a real disservice to do a great, to do a movie about the Navajo Code Talkers, but it's really a movie about Nick Cage. Right. Directed by John Woo. Yeah. Yeah. It's a violent war movie that happened to to be structured around a really interesting historical plot. Right. Like, let's, let's take this really amazing story from history mm-hmm. and, and let's morph it into a story about a white soldier. It's like um, Dirty Instead. Dancing to Havana Nights, basically. <laughs> oh, it's funny. It is. <laughs> Yeah, so Wind Talkers, I do, I do not endorse that film. I do not either, and neither of us have seen it, and we still don't endorse that film. No, I don't. I just need to see the, the reviews on that one. But the 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 point of it was that there was a uh, Native American. I don't know if he's a Navajo or not um, in that movie because mm-hmm. again, haven't seen it. Yeah, but um, who was who was charged with speaking his native tongue? To someone else on the other end of the line Mm -hmm. at the front lines of battle in the Pacific Theater during World War II um, to transmit messages in code, in an unbreakable code. And that actually happened. Mm -hmm. Like that part of the story happened, and it was true, that there were in World War II Native Americans, uh, in large part Navajo, Mm -hmm. who were speaking to one another in Navajo, Mm -hmm. like on Guadalcanal or um, in the uh, Marianas, or the Marshall Islands, or Okinawa, who were there (laughs) at all of these major, massive battles in the Pacific Theater between the the United States and Japan Mm -hmm. um, that actually eventually led to this island-hopping process, led to the um, 
the atomic bombs being dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki from the Marianas. Yeah, a c- code so, uh, well, complex to our dumb ears, mm-hmm. to the Navajo, they were just like, this is just our language. True, but even if you're a linguist, you're like, this is oh, an sure. extraordinarily difficult language. Yeah, but so complex that um, it confounded the Japanese who were really good at busting codes. And they were like, I don't know what's going on here. You're yeah, right. Yeah. Like, this is, a, a, I've never heard anything like this. Which was a huge reversal because prior to the institution of um, Navajo code talkers in, I think, 1942, like late 1942, um, the Japanese had our goat with our coded transmissions. Because for the, for the number one, there were a number of Japanese people who had been educated in the U.S. in between World War I and World War II mm-hmm. um, and had gone back to Japan prior to World War II, and they were totally fluent in English. Yeah. So they could speak English, like, up, down, and sideways. Yeah. Plus, on top of that, they were really good at breaking our codes. So th- they knew basically everything we were going to do every step of the way. So the Navajo code talkers coming into the Pacific Theater was— it reversed our fortunes. Like oh, yeah. there's, there's, it's not an overstatement to say that they basically helped the U.S. take the Pacific yeah. from Japan, all, not single-handedly, but through their code. Yeah, for sure. All right, so let's talk about the Navajo uh, in general to begin with, a uh, Native American tribe um, that inhabited the American Southeast or what, you know, now we know it as the American Southwest. Right. <laughs> Back then, it was known as the Southeast. Yeah, exactly. And you're like, what? <laughs> this isn't the coast? Uh, American Southwest. <laughs> right. I wish everyone could see because Josh literally just pointed in the other direction. <laughs> I wonder <laughs> if you pointed west. It, uh, no. You pointed that way. Is that west? I don't even know. Uh, hold on. No, that's that's north. Okay. The American I pointed south. The American South North. Right. Uh, they uh, the original um, peoples were. They believe from Asia, well, um, yeah. maybe ironically in the end, mm. when you see how the story goes, uh, and settled in the southwest around 1400 mm. CE. Um, in the 1600s, uh, a lot of things changed. The next few hundred years, were uh, they were warring with the Spanish. They were warring with other Native American tribes. Mm-hmm. And then that was all kind of leading up to the 1800s when the United States – popped up and said, hey, um, here's what we're going to do. We're going to wreck your economy. We're going to destroy your crops and livestock and poison your wells and kill all your buffalo and put you on reservations and uh, march you you to to New Mexico where your new home will be and will be known as the Long Walk. Yeah, it was basically their their trail of tears. Yeah, exactly. It was just right out of the... Westward Expansion Playbook. Yep. Um, and so the Navajo found themselves, I, when was that? The mid, it was 1857, I think. Yeah. And long like, walk. why that, I mean, it's important for a lot of reasons, mm-hmm. but um, the, the men who ended up being the Navajo code talkers in World War II, mm-hmm. their grandparents were, were these people that were forced to go on the long walk. Yes. And this like, was, it wasn't, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years later. Right. Like direct descendants that ended up fighting for the United States. Yes. And this is not like a, hey, do you mind moving over here? It was it was very much like the Trail of Tears. It was movement 300 miles to a reservation against their will um, at the barrel of a gun. Yeah, like, I don't want to go. Okay, I'll shoot you. Yes, exactly. And yeah. There were reports of um, of the injured, of the tired, people who fell behind were just shot by the U.S. infantry. Mm-hmm. Um, there was at least one family that reported that their pregnant daughter was, um, they were forced away from her. And she was kept behind and they heard her being shot as well. Yeah. It was, it was, it was just a, a violation, an atrocity done to the Navajo like it was done to so many other Native American groups. And by the 19th century, like basically 1857 on, the Navajo lived exclusively on reservations in, in the Southwest. Yeah, and starting in about the 1870s, the U.S. government said, here's what we're going to do. Um, you have to assimilate into American society. We want you to uh, forget your culture as you knew it. Right. You can't speak your native language anymore. Um, we're going to round up your kids and send them to American boarding schools, mm-hmm. teach them to read and write in English only. 
uh, and you're going to be uh, punished and forbidden from speaking uh, your native tongue, from singing in your native tongue. Yes, you will be beaten if yes. we catch you speaking Navajo to one another. And they, like I think you just said, they, they would kidnap children, mm-hmm. take them to these schools, just like they did with the Aboriginal tribes in Australia, um, just like they did with the First Americans in, um, or the First Nations in Canada. Yep. And it was just, not only uh, have we taken your land, not only have we forced you to live in this one area that no one else wants to live in, like, we want to destroy your culture now. Like, we're going after your culture. We yeah. just want to obliterate you guys completely. We'll let you live, but under these these conditions, and we're not we're going to murder your culture. And so, not only were these code talkers the grandchildren or the grandsons of the people who went on the long walk, they were the very people mm-hmm. who w- went to these Indian schools and were beaten for speaking Navajo. And then about 1942. The United States military, specifically the Marines, showed up and said, hey, we'd love for you to come speak Navajo officially for the United States government. Would you mind doing that? Yeah, and this was after uh, World War I. It, it, it went on in World War I, actually. Um, World War II got all the press, and the Navajo, mm-hmm. of course, did more than anyone else, like mm-hmm. you said. But in World War I, there were, um, in 1918, there was a captain from the 142nd Infantry Regiment who heard— um, two Choctaw soldiers speaking in their native tongue right. and was like, man, we're getting hammered with the Germans and the French cracking our codes. So I think that this language could be of use to us because it's really complex. Germans have no idea what what's going on with your language. Mm-hmm. And I think we could put you to use. And so the, the very first code talkers, I think, were these Choctaw code talkers in World War One? Yeah, the the well, we were fighting with the French and we were talking to the French, but the Germans spoke French and English, and we were using regular telephone lines in World War One, I, I guess. Sure, and they just had them tapped, so they were just eavesdropping, and we might as well have been speaking German for as well as they were translating these coded transmissions. Yeah. Now all of a sudden they're like, "What is what is this? We've never heard this language before ever." It's just a couple of Choctaw guys talking to one another, but it was, uh, for Germany, an unbreakable code, at, at least as long as World War I was going on. Yeah, and I don't think this early World War I code was so much a code as, like, you're saying, like, right. we're just going to put a Choctaw on one end and a Choctaw on the other end of the line. That's it. And they'll just relay the messages that we tell them to in their native tongue, mm-hmm. and the Germans were like, nine! <laughs> right. <laughs> so, only word I could think of. Uh, Nine. H- Hogan. <laughs> that was World War Two. <laughs> Shoot, that would, that would come years later. So um, it wasn't just uh, Choctaw members of the Choctaw tribe who were code talkers in World War One. Also, the Comanche played a, a role. Yeah. Um, the Fox, which is also known as the um, oh man, I had it. Have you ever heard of the Fox Tribe from, I believe, Mississippi? I don't think so. You? Oh, you don't? Um, there was also the Comanche. They played a big role, and some other tribes did as well. Yeah. But there's like, we're, we're talking a handful of people in, in the capacity, like you were saying. It's like, uh, just say this in your native language to this other guy who speaks your native language, and he'll tell, you know, the guy on the other end what you just said in English. Yeah, and here's the rub I mean, there, it is rich with irony throughout this whole story, but here's the rub in World War I, is that Native Americans weren't even granted citizenship until 1924. So the World War I code talkers were not even American citizens, yet they were doing this. Uh, and they were not even recognized by the United States and acknowledged and thanked until 2008. Right. 2008, 10 years ago. France even recognized them in, I think, 1988. 89, yeah. 89. Did you say that? No. Okay. So France recognized them first, and it took another 20 years before the U.S. recognized them officially. Unbelievable. It is unbelievable. Um, but the 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 problem with World War One is it worked, but we became friendly with Germany mm-hmm. in between World War One and World War Two, And Germany said, yeah, we're going to hedge our bets here. We're going to send some people to the United States to learn— Native American languages and culture. Mm -hmm. So that if we ever go to war with the United States again, we'll have their number. 
yeah. they did. Apparently, there were plenty of, well, I don't know if plenty is the right word, but there were Germans mm-hmm. who spoke um, C- Cherokee, Comanche, Choctaw. That's crazy. So that um, so much so that the, the some of the American um, commanders in World War II were like, we can't use Native American language because there's Germans who know this already. They were compromised basically yeah. between World War One and World War Two. You want to take a break? Oh yes. All right, let's take a break, and we're going to come back and talk about uh, the dawn of World War Two and a man named Philip Johnston. All right. So right before World War II, um, there was a training exercise going on with uh, with soldiers from Michigan and Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. And there were Native American soldiers involved, and there was a man, uh, and they were you know they were testing out these coded transmissions. They were like, "We did it in World War One. Let's try it again." And there was a man there named Philip Johnston, uh, who was a white man, but he actually grew up on a Navajo reservation. Well, I think he just read an article about this, actually. Oh, really? Uh-huh. Um, well, yeah, he wasn't in the Army at this time. Right, right. Because they brought him in, like, he was way too old. Way too old. But around this time, I think he was about 50 years old. Yeah, but— So old. He had the benefit of growing up on a Navajo reservation, Right. considered himself a Navajo, spoke the language, fought in World War One, and said— I want to make a comeback, and I want to go back and fight in World War II and start up this crack team of Navajo code talkers. It was his idea, yeah. and they said he went into the office of whatever higher-up general he needed to, spoke some Navajo, and said, this worked once. Why can't it work twice? And they were just like, by George, I think you're on to something. Well, here. they said, we'll give, you a, we'll give you a chance to demonstrate this. So apparently in Los Angeles, he recruited – uh, four Navajo men who I guess he was friendly with because, like you said, he considered himself Navajo. His parents were missionaries. Yeah. Um, and apparently he spoke Navajo so well that at age nine, he served as the official translator for a Navajo delegation that had gone to, to Washington, D.C. to lobby for better treatment and rights for the Navajo Nation. Which is amazing because, as you'll learn, the— uh not a lot of – because there were other white people mm-hmm. who spoke Navajo that tried to be code talkers, and mm-hmm. none of them made the cut. No. Because it's such a hard language. Right. So this guy must have just had an ear for it too. Yeah. And was raised with it. Yep. But um, he uh, he said, "We, I, I know you guys are trying to make a code. I've got this language. I've got these four guys from Los Angeles with me. Just give them a shot. And so they gave him a shot at, I think, Camp Elliott. And um, they, they gave two – they – Took the two, uh, the four Navajo guys, broke them into pairs, put them in separate rooms, and said, "Here, say this in Navajo. Say this English phrase. Um, yeah. The the eagle lands at midnight. We'll say, <laughs> right? <laughs> that old bit. <laughs> and tell your buddies and see what they say. So yeah. they transmitted the eagle lands at midnight or whatever it was um, uh, over the phone in Navajo. The guys in the other room took it in Navajo, translated it back into English in like a minute." And the uh, guys at Camp Elliott were pretty impressed by this. They said, we're going to bring in some German and Japanese people to listen. Right. And they were like, did you guys get that? And they went, I have no idea. They said nine. Right. <laughs> and whatever the Japanese word is for no, do you know that? Uh, niet. Niet? Oh, really? No. <laughs> I was like, that sounds a lot like Russian. What is the Japanese word from no? They say no so infrequently. I was about to say, you know why you don't know that? Because all you say is yes when, right. you, get, when you go over there. Yeah. Sure. I'll take more. Yes. More, <laughs> please. They just bang my bowl on the table. So, uh, so yeah, they, they, they actually didn't do that. I'm kidding, of course. But they said, this is great. And this is – the trick was not only was it um, like basically impossible to crack, mm-hmm. but like you were saying, it was super fast, way faster than machine codes. Right. So that's a huge advantage that this this offered was you're using um, Navajo speakers to send a coded message. Prior to this, and in addition to this, you would you would use basically machines mm-hmm. that used algorithms to encode and decode a message. And it could take hours, hours. If you're trying to send a desperate message 
on a frontline battle in the Pacific theater, Mm -hmm. you don't have hours for that thing to to get across. So the idea that you could do the same thing in minutes Mm -hmm. in a code that you were just positive the Japanese would have no idea what to do with, that was a huge advantage for sure. Yeah, and like the Grabster pointed out, it it was taking a long time with the code machines that the Germans and Japanese were cracking anyway. Right. So this was the solution. There was like no... No downside to it. All right. So like we said, Johnston was – Philip Johnston was uh, far too old because he was a World War I veteran. Mm-hmm. Uh, they gave him a special commission, said you're now a staff sergeant in the Marines again. Or I don't know if he was in the Marine or in the Army initially. Do you I, know? Don't, I don't know. But at any rate, he was in the Marines this time. And they said, you're going to lead the Code Talker project. Mm-hmm. Uh, go out and recruit. So he went to reservations, recruited young men. uh and between three and four hundred of these young men became uh, code talkers. He, he recruited more than that, but a lot of them failed mm-hmm. out uh, for very various reasons. Like, you know, they still had to go through boot camp and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. So you still had to be a soldier on top of it. Mm-hmm. Although it was a kind of a, a truncated version of boot camp because they had to get them in there quick. They needed them so badly. They're like, okay, yeah, 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 you're fine. Yeah. You know, we need to take you to code school. Basically, yeah. But the whole thing started with um, 30. They originally recruited 30 Navajo speakers. One of them dropped out. So 29, there were 29 original Navajo code talkers. And they were put to work initially creating the code because very importantly, the Navajo code talkers not only spoke to one another in Navajo, which was incomprehensible to basically anybody living it, listening to it who yeah. didn't speak it, um, they would also use a code, they would use code words in Navajo. Mm-hmm. So what they created was a code within a code. And yes. it was as unbreakable as as any any code's ever been come up with, that anyone's ever come up with. Well, I think we should, so you and I can't speak Navajo. Uh, I'm not, I'm, I'm rusty. <laughs> I, I think we should play just a little bit of Navajo. All right. And then I'll I'll translate. Tado la yes kahe a kede njogahagi analye asha aji lago keya nizad le go ajiya ako ade se njogago analye enye open zizne. So what you just heard in Navajo was um this is from the the parable of the prodigal son. I this found is from the YouTube. movie Wind Talkers. <laughs> uh, what you just heard was not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. Something everybody does from time to time. But that was that was what you just heard in Navajo. Yeah. Um, and it's it's so foreign sounding um, for a reason. Like it's a really difficult language in that like the same – vowel can have four different types of intonation Mm. and four different meanings. So one word can have four different meanings based on the whether, you know, you go up or you speak through your nose or whatever, but you're saying the same word, you're just intoning it differently. Yeah. uh, And that just changes the meaning dramatically. That was one reason why it was so impenetrable. Yeah. And like you said, they, um, Mm. they memorized 500 code words, three different versions of the alphabet, Mm -hmm. and went to war. I mean, I I use the word irony. I don't even, that's, that sort of undersells it, uh, what was going on and why these men would, um, would sign up for something like this. And, and Ed points out, like, you can't get into the head of them or explain every person's motivation. For sure. Because it was all different. But um, through interviews, you know, what, what sort of stood out was that they still, even though that, the United States had stomped them down into near oblivion. They still had a tie to that land. Right. And that was their land. And regardless of what had gone on in the past, um, the Germans and the Japanese were uh, were invaders. They, they were a threat to their holy land. They were still a, a common enemy between the United States and the Navajo. Yeah. I mean, it's just a, it says so much about their people <clears throat> that they could— just put all the other stuff aside and the genocide and the long walk and mm-hmm. the trail of tears and say, well, this this is still my land. 
uh, even though I'm on a reservation and I don't want, I want to help protect it. Right. Amazing. Yeah, some of them were were joined up because they're um, they subscribe to the Navajo warrior culture, and the Navajo definitely had their own warrior warrior culture, although that wasn't like necessarily the central focus of their culture. Right. Others were like, oh man, you're going to get me off of this reservation, and I'm going to go travel the world. I've never even been on a bus before. Let's go. Yeah. Um, some of them were like, I like this GI Bill you're talking about. Um, others were drafted, didn't want to go, but they were still drafted and they went. So there were just like to, to paint it any other way is to make it like to give it the wind talker treatment. Yeah. And that's not the stuff you should know way. There were a, <laughs> as many different people. Uh, I think there were 421 Navajo code talkers who ended up serving in World War II. I'm sure there were 421 different reasons for why they went. Yeah. That's just the way it is. They're they're people. Yeah. And we're talking about people here. 420, huh? 421. Yeah. <laughs> Dollar short, day late. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about this code within a code. Um, here, here's one example. So troops moving forward to the lake is what the grabster came up with. Mm-hmm. And they wouldn't just get on the horn mm-hmm. with their Navajo uh, counterpart on the other end and say, troops moving forward to the lake in Navajo, Mm -hmm. they would substitute in different words. Sometimes they would spell out some words one letter at a time with that letter being represented by a word, like the first letter in the word that they say. Mm -hmm. And it was the, I mean, there there were rules for the code, but the person on the other end, they were so in sync with one another that they didn't necessarily look at a chart and say, well, this is means this and this means this. Mm-hmm. They were just able to converse rather organically within this code, within the code. Right. And they all knew that that code that was like this means this and this means this. Yeah. But, yeah, from 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 the research, it seems like they were able to shift and, and like you said, make it organic. Yeah. On the fly, and they knew what one another was saying. Kind of threw out the playbook a little bit, I imagine, yeah. in certain circumstances. Uh, and I'm sure the American, uh, you know, the the generals and the people in charge were just like, just do it, man. Just do your thing. Or they were like, I have no idea what you just said. <laughs> yeah, they, they had no idea they threw out the playbook. Uh, a lot of times they had to do that because there weren't uh, equivalents of certain words. Like they didn't have words for uh, bombardment and and shell casing and things like that because they mm-hmm. didn't have those things in their culture. Right. So they had to make up things that they would uh, be able to understand both ways. Well, they they were also, so there was an, al- an alphabet, right? So every... Three alphabets. Three, yes, that's yeah. right. So there were three different words for every letter of the alphabet. It's amazing. Okay. Um, but there's something that is really easy to look past that we really have to, to think, this is one of the reasons why this is so unbreakable. If, if you um, wanted to use the letter I... Well, you would say the Navajo word for ice. Right. Okay. But the Navajo word for ice doesn't have, it doesn't begin with the letter I. They probably didn't have a word for ice, though. But that's funny that you picked well, that no, word. Well, no, they, they, the weird thing is, is that they did. They did? They, yes. How did they, they have actually, ice? It was, they're most closely related to a native Alaskan tongue. Oh, which okay. Which is why they think. So natural ice. It's like evidence. It's linguistic evidence. They came across the Bering Land Bridge. Gotcha. Um, so, yeah, they also have a word for shark, which is like. That doesn't make any sense either. If they, they're they're Very from Arizona, basically in New Was Mexico, it land shark. <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> yeah, they're like Chevy Chase. Yeah, um, but they but they have like a, a lot of they have one for salmon, copperhead salmon. Mm. And that's, you know, delicious. not a lot of those in New Mexico. But yeah, it is delicious. But the the point is, is the Navajo word um, for ice doesn't necessarily begin with I. So even if you knew yeah. Navajo, you wouldn't necessarily know that this is the word for the letter I. Yeah. And then to confound it even more, if there's three different words for the letter I, uh-huh. even if you're spelling like... Um, well, what's a word with multiple eyes? Hurry up and give me one quick. <laughs> uh, illicit? Yes. Okay. If you're spelling illicit out, you could use two different words for I, and that cuts down on letter, or in this case, code word repetition, which is one of the easiest ways to break a code. Yeah. Look for repetitions. Right, right. And pair those up with the letters that are used most frequently in English. Yeah. So if you're using three different code words for a single letter, you can 
mix it up oh, yeah, while man. you're spelling it out so cool. makes it even more impenetrable. Yeah. Like, this is just such a gorgeous code. Yeah, they used um, imagery a lot of times, which is makes it kind of strangely lyrical, like a, um, a dive bomber was a chicken hawk, a submarine was an iron fish. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they also use, you know, you heard a Cockney rhyming slang. Yeah. Um, which is, geez, we, we could do a podcast on that, but that'd be kind of cool. Okay. Um, I won't even get into that, but <laughs> it, it makes basically make compound words in an English sound like a word uh, in the message. So um, the the examples that the grabster uh, got was like the word secured, they would say the Navajo words for sheep cured mm-hmm. or dispatch became dog is patch mm-hmm. in Navajo, though. Right. But, so still, even if you knew Navajo uh-huh. and you heard dog is patch, uh-huh. you wouldn't know that that meant dispatch. Right. And if you didn't know Navajo, you wouldn't be able to hear and be like, oh, that rhymes with dispatched. I'll bet that's what they yeah. said. It doesn't sound like anything you've ever heard before in your life. Yeah. And like you said, they would they were so familiar with mm-hmm. it and comfortable with it that they would switch it up on the fly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, you know, again, technically they had – um, they would do something to alert the the person mm-hmm. that was like a, a system in place to say like now we're going to use this version, but they they were they didn't even need to do that really right that just seemed like a formality yeah. it sounds like yeah but and I think one of the reasons why they were so able to shift like that um, because these these guys who were raised in the Indian schools, they had to speak to one another in Navajo like surreptitiously. Yeah. So they had to be able to shift on the fly, not, yeah. not just between like um, nuance and Navajo, which is a very nuanced language to begin with, but also between Navajo and English, depending on who is coming their way. Right. Um, so there was a, the, I, I think, I, um, it's my impression that from the, the treatment in Indian school, um, it, it would have made it easier for them to understand what somebody was saying when they broke the the rules of the language really quickly. Yeah. They'd be able to follow. And then, Chuck, there's one other thing that made this code even more beautiful. It wasn't written down. Yeah. In 1942, there was no book, no document, no text that you no. could get in Teach Yourself Navajo. You couldn't get it. Nope. And like you said, even some like white kids that were raised out on trading posts and spoke Navajo their whole life, they washed out of the Code Talker program. They had basically a success rate. Non-Navajo um, had a success rate of basically zero in the Code Talker program for Navajo code. Yeah. It was just that hard. Yeah. And that nuanced. Amazing. All right. Let's take another break. Yeah. I'm pretty I'm pretty jazzed up here, yes. All right, and we'll come back and talk about uh how this how this really affected the war right after this. All right, so like we said, at this point in the war, when they were brought in, uh, the Navajo Code Talkers, it was uh, the fighting in Europe was dwindling, mm-hmm. and the Pacific Theater is where things were really happening. Mm-hmm. And so the first action for the actual Navajo Code Talkers were at Guadalcanal. And I hope we didn't paint a picture that they're sitting in offices talking to one another in an air conditioned office on telephones and just sending orders to, like, go bomb this place on Saturday. Uh, a lot of times these men are on the front lines mm-hmm. and relaying um, positions and uh, what's what it's like on the ground and what's going on. It wasn't just directives to go do this. Uh, they were relaying important information like live in the moment on the front lines. Right. And to add to this, there was confusion a lot of times, even among American soldiers, like mm-hmm. to an American soldier 50 feet away, a Navajo Code talker might look like uh, a Japanese uh, person. Does it? Were these like the very dumbest soldiers of all? I don't know, man. I mean, it's on record that there was friendly fire because of this. So, so they they were actually fired on. I saw that like they had like guns pointed at them at some point and would be like marched over to be interrogated. It was such that they felt like they needed to assign them personal guards, which yeah. was friggin' Nick Cage. I mean, that's <laughs> what that movie was about is that he was a white soldier assigned to guard one of the Navajo 
code talkers because they were being mistaken for Japanese soldiers. Right, but he was also secretly ordered to kill that code talker well, that rather movie. than let them fall into the hands of the Japanese. Yeah, I wonder if that's a thing or if that was wholly created for that movie. I don't know. Like, it's a, it, I, I don't know. I could see it go both ways. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how smart the soldiers were. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and confusing. I don't think, right. I don't think it happened very often. And I think all it has to happen is two or three times and all of a sudden that's like part of the legend, you know? Yeah, maybe so. Um, but it did happen. I mean, it, like it was, it happened from time to time. There was a guy named, um, I think George McCabe, who was a Navajo code talker who was taken prisoner by a Americans. fellow American. Yeah. Um, because he was standing in a chow line on the beach at Guadalcanal waiting to get food. And the guy was like, you look Japanese. That's exactly what he did. <laughs> Pointed a gun at him and said, you're coming with me. And then I'm sure it was like, uh, sorry, but no, William McCabe, I'm sorry. Um, but that was, that's, yeah. I, I, if you look at a picture of a, a Navajo code talker, yeah. you look at a picture of a Japanese person, I don't see the, the resemblance. You should have been on the front lines, my friend. I would have been like, dude, <laughs> dude, what are you doing? Yeah. Uh, the the language itself, and again, this is kind of funny because the language sounds nothing like Japanese, but sometimes U.S. radio operators would jam the frequency. I guess, I mean, the grabster said that because they mistook it for Japanese, mm-hmm. I imagine they just heard a, a foreign language and just jammed it. Right. Um, I don't know if they necessarily thought it sounded like Japanese. It sounds like its own thing for sure. Yeah, maybe they had no idea what Japanese or Navajo even sounded like and was just like, it ain't English. Maybe they were under orders for like, yeah, if it's not in English, jam it. Yeah, possibly. I could see that. So these, uh, like we said, the speed was one of the real keys and just how quickly they could get these messages delivered. uh, And it allowed them to, uh, here's a great great quote from uh, Philip Johnson who started the program. Mm -hmm. He said, uh, during the first 48 hours, and uh, this is at Iwo Jima, he said, while we were landing and consolidating our shore positions, I had six Navajo radio nets operating around the clock. In that period alone, they sent and received more than 800 messages without an error. In 48 hours. Man. 800 messages. No mistakes. No mistakes. That's amazing. And they're relaying these messages, again, in minutes, and each of them would have taken hours to decode. Yeah, uh, without the the Navajo code talkers, there was another quote from a guy named Major Howard Connor who was on Iwo Jima as well in the Signal Corps, and he said, um, paraphrasing here, that the Marines would not have taken Iwo Jima had it not been for the Navajo code talkers. Yeah, the entire operation, Iwo Jima, the, you know, the very famous like flag raising statue, <laughs> it was Iwo Jima. <laughs> yeah, um, basically a turning point in the Pacific. That the entire operation was done in Navajo. The, the, that was what was spoken over the radios for the entire yeah, operation. It's amazing. It really is. I mean, like, if you think about how many American lives were saved by that, that's, I mean, that was just such a direct contribution to the war. Yeah. Um, Iwo Jima. That was huge. Yeah. I mean, that's all you can say. Yeah, this this deserves its own movie treatment, like, uh, sort of like Hidden Figures. Yeah. Like these minority voices who really had this huge impact that never got their due. Mm-hmm. And, you know, with the Navajo Code Talkers, they came back to the uh, after the war and um, it was classified what went on until 1968. Uh, Apparently, they may have uh, done this in Vietnam and Korea, although I don't think anyone is totally knows that for sure. That seems to be rumor. Yeah. Yeah. But they did not. uh, You would think like, oh, and after 1968, they were just put on a pedestal and praised Mm -hmm. um, all throughout the United States. Uh, That is not true. They were basically sent back to the reservations. Uh, with what awaited them there, which was poverty and hardship and alcoholism Mm -hmm. and disenfranchisement. And um, some, I mean, some of them were were lucky enough to bootstrap up from military service. I imagine. I think ones that stayed in the military afterward and made a career out of it tended to do better than ones that, you know, went back right after the war. Some of them were able to get into college, um, some of them tried to buy houses on the reservation through the GI Bill, yeah. which was very much their right as veterans after World War II. Um, but through a fluke of the treaties that put them on the reservation, they don't they they didn't actually own the land. The land that they owned 
was held in trust, so they couldn't show the bank actually own this land or right. the guy I'm trying to buy this land from owns the land. Mm -hmm. So the GI Bill was useless for a lot of them, which is a big uh, black eye on... It was just basically par for the course for how most of them were treated afterward. Yeah. Um, I mean, just right back on the reservation. It was just the usual reservation life again. Uh, 1969, there was a, a reunion at the 4th Marine Division. <clears throat> uh, in 71, Nixon awarded them a certificate of thanks. <laughs> yeah, and, and a, a light punch in the arm from old Tricky Dick. Uh, in 1982, August 14th was declared National Code Talker Day. That was for all code talkers. Yeah, not just Navajo code mm -hmm. talkers. Uh, but those original 29 uh, were given a Congressional Gold Medal in 2000. And uh, in 2014, on June 4th, the, the final original code talker, Navajo code talker, Chester Nez, passed away and... Uh, just look up a picture of Chester Nez in Easy. Mm -hmm. Just that sweet face, and mm -hmm. he's got the veteran's hat on that says Navajo Code Talker on it. Oh, I love those hats. Man. Pretty amazing. Um, the the uh, the award ceremony. So they were awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor in two thousand, the original twenty nine. But when they actually presented the award in yeah. two thousand one, by that time there were only four of them left alive. Yeah, and that's a big criticism too. Um, that it was like you could have probably done this a little a little sooner yeah, while might, they were alive still. Yeah, could have. It might have taken sixty something years to just sort of get that ceremony in order. <laughs> right, <laughs> they wanted to get everything just right, but that was uh, amazing. And yeah, hopefully somebody will make a movie about it that's not mostly about Nick Cage's yeah. character, <laughs> That'd be the great. white guy. <laughs> Uh, if you want to know more about code talkers, you can search them on the internet, and there's some fascinating stuff out there. Oh, and Chuck, if you want to know more about Navajo code talkers and you happen to ever be in Cayenta, Arizona, there's a Burger King there, and it has <laughs> basically a Navajo code talker museum. Oh, cool. It's basically a display case, but it counts, it qualifies as a mini museum. Sure, grab a Whopper, learn something. Yeah. And since I said that, it's time for listener mail. I'm going to call this uh, Easy Bake Oven Follow-Up um, from Oregon. So, guys, just listen to Easy Bake Ovens. Um, I've always been a big believer in kids playing with whatever toys they want. Uh, and as a kid, I spent a great deal of time playing in the dirt with my brothers, making roads and parking lots for our Hot Wheels. Uh, flash forward 20 years, my son wanted me to take him to the toy store to spend some sixth birthday money. Sixth birthday money. You got it. Uh, I followed him as he perused the remote control cars, various action figures, and he disappeared around the corner. And before I could get to the other aisle to find him, he came tromping back holding an Easy Bake Oven. He asked me if he had enough money to buy it, and he did. <laughs> awesome. Uh, this was in 1999. It was about 20 bucks. As he, uh, as we walked to the counter, I asked him if he wanted me to carry it for him, put it in a cart, because the box was about as big as he was. And he insisted on carrying it himself. Uh, although I've always encouraged him to play with what he wants, I was surprised that he wanted to carry it himself. Uh, his dad was not always so open-minded to boys playing with what he called girl toys mm. and probably still isn't. Uh, we are no longer together, needless to say. Mm. Anyway, we pay for the oven and my son carries it to the car. He won't let me put it in the trunk or even in the seat next to him. He held it on his lap the whole way home. <laughs> the story's just adorbs in it every is. way. I love it. Uh, while we were driving, he examined the box and made a harumph sound, asked him what was wrong, and he said uh, that he was mad and asked him why. He said, the box is pink and there's only a girl on it, but boys like to cook too, Mom. Told him I agree. Uh, so I guess you could say he has always been woke. Uh, he made many <laughs> treats with his oven over the years, and I even have a photo of him somewhere wearing his grandma's frilly cooking apron with a big smile on his face. And that is from Davina uh, M. Berry in Portland, Oregon. Another M. Berry? Is there another one? Yeah. Really? Yeah. We never really figured out how to say that last name, but there was, like, within the last month or two, there was an M. Berry. Huh. Weird. I wonder well, if it was her. Thanks a lot, Davina. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it was. <laughs> I think the other one was with an E. That's with an I, huh? Oh, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. I will figure it out one day. Yeah. Uh, if you want to, if you're an Emberry or an Embery or whatever, you want to get in touch with us, you can uh, join us on social. Just go to stuffyoushouldknow.com and find all the links there, or send us all an email to stuffpodcast at howstuffworks.com. For more 
more on this and thousands of other topics, visit HowStuffWorks.com. 